Thank you very much for this invitation. I'll be covering the topic of the uh, immunological considerations in AV gene therapy. Um, <clears throat> unwanted immune uh, reactions have occurred in gene therapy, and this is still a concern. Um, when people are injected with uh, any kind of gene therapy product, um, there are, uh, the, it's been observed several types of reactions, such as innate reactions with the famous cytokine storm, which actually can be lethal. Immunization, we've talked about immunization against uh, AAV capsid, for instance, but uh, other types of vectors are also immunogenic. Tissue destruction has been uh, engaged, and also loss of therapeutic efficacy. So this is really a problem in gene therapy broadly. And of course, it can be uh, controlled by the injection of immunosuppressive regimens, but there's always a risk benefit associated to this type of therapy. So I'm going to focus really on the aspects of immune responses in gene therapy with recombinant and no associated vectors. Of course, there's been a very nice introduction from the two previous speakers, so I will not spend too much time discussing the vector. You should know, of course, that this is a very broadly used vector, which is probably why you're here. There's already two approved products on the market, although uh, in Europe it's been uh, recalled, I mean, uh, you know, uh, retracted, but uh, there's one, of course, in the U.S. About 100 clinical studies are ongoing in rare genetic diseases or in more frequent diseases and it's going on all over the world. And of course, we're talking about applications of AV in gene therapy for uh, monogenic diseases or other diseases, but also AV is used to inject, for instance, uh, uh, opsin for optogenetics. And uh, there's other things that are coming up, such as, for instance, the use of AV for delivering the uh, uh, homology-directed uh, uh, repair template, for instance, in genome editing with CRISPR. And of course, AV is used for vaccination. But I'm going to focus really on the problems uh, related to the use of AV for gene transfer and primarily for uh, rare genetic diseases. So again, I'm not going to really go over all the description of the AV. I think what's really uh, important here is that there's several kinds, of course, of, of particles that are in fact composed by the type of genome that is packaged, either a single strand or self-complementary. And of course, from the immunological perspective, these are important signals that the uh, innate sensing molecules can actually detect. And of course, you have the protein capsid around this uh, genome, and there's many different capsid serotypes. There's natural serotypes, about 13, but there's many, many more variants that are, in fact have been engineered. And these capsids, in fact, define the tropism of the particle based on a receptor, but also many other cofactors which are not always very well defined. And what's important here is that this will determine just as much the entry of the particles into the target tissues, but also the recognition and the interaction with the immune system. So there are many respo immune uh, responses limitation with AV gene therapy. Uh, AV has been injected either locally, for instance, in the eye or in the brain. It's in injected systemically, IV, uh, for liver delivery or for, for instance, skeletal muscle gene correction now. And um, there are several kinds of problems. The first problem is that, in fact, many individuals are already immunized against the AV due to this natural infection against the wild type virus. And this, in fact, generates pre existing antibodies which are neutralizing and can block the entry. So that means that there are a lot of uneligible uh, individuals to clinical trials with AV. Then, of course, whenever you inject AV into an individual, you immunize that person, and you immunize that person against the capsid, you immunize and you generate antibody response and T cell responses, and this can induce, not always, but they can induce some toxicity with loss of therapeutic efficacy, and of course, they prevent redosing, because once you've been immunized by the gene therapy vector and you have those neutralizing antibodies, then you really cannot come back again. Then finally, of course, you use gene uh, transfer and the transgene that you introduce in the individual with a V gene therapy is potentially immunogenic. And of course, you have an antibody anti-cell response that can be potentially uh, uh, elicited against the transgene product that will again also potentially lead to therapeutic loss of efficacy and inflammation or toxicity. So I will cover all this to try to address some of the mechanisms involved. Uh, whether or not we can actually control these immune responses and how can we monitor and perhaps predict these immune responses. So just by way of introduction, so generally speaking, uh, there's nothing really particularly 
different about AV as it could be any kind of virus or any kind of antigen that's introduced into the body. The first thing it will encounter, it will encounter in fact all the effectors and all the soluble and the uh, cellular effectors of the innate immune response. So these include complement proteins and many other proteins which bind to AV and will in fact probably address that to phagocytes and other cells of the innate immune system. Then there will be presentation to professional antigen presenting cells, which in fact are here to detect you know, viruses and other pathogens. And then you'll have the start of the adaptive immune response, T or B. And we should probably start to include other types of cells, such as natural killer cells, which may in fact play an important role uh, with AV immune responses that we still don't understand very well. Now, of course, just also as a way of a general introduction, immune responses are complex and they are made of many different waves. You have these innate immune responses made of cytokine or things that occur very, very rapidly after the initiation of the immune response. And then you have a wave of cellular effector T cell response followed by regulatory T cells. Um, that in fact are here to dampen and, and, and control the immune response before then you start also to see the appearance of the antibodies with the different wave of different classes of antibodies which are in fact also determined by the innate immune response. So this in fact is a very basic uh, notion but I want to warn you against the idea that with one snapshot in time you can understand what's going on in terms of the immune response. You really have to follow kinetics and this is particularly important for instance when people are talking about regulatory T cells or effector T cells, these two responses are always induced. But uh, you know you have to really follow them and look at the relative proportion of each of them to really understand what's going on. So of course all of this is determined also by the host status, the genetic makeup of the person, uh, in particular whether or not they are genetically null against the transgene, for instance, will make a huge difference in terms of their ability to raise an immune response, uh, their inflammatory status. And of course, the dose, the route, and the immunosuppressive um, aspects which can affect one part or the other of the immune response. And least but not all, of course, the properties of the vector. And we've just discussed you know, how you can completely differently engineer different types of AV so they can be very differently immunogenic. So let me address the first question, which is the seropositivity to the AV capsid. So natural exposure to AV even can occur in all of us and um, it occurs early in life and it results in the induction of um, pre-existing neutralizing antibodies with different levels depending on the different um, 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 serotypes, so, but this can concern up to 70% of the population. And they can be found also in uh, newborns and uh, they will cross-react with a very wide range of serotypes. So this reduces tremendously the efficacy of course of gene transfer and titers as low as one to five in fact might in fact prevent the administration and, 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 and correct gene transfer. So this in fact is inserted into uh, clinical trials and is as an exclusion criteria because uh, of course these uh, patients cannot receive uh, treatment by AV, uh, it will be uh, more or less inefficient. So these natural uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies uh, interfere with the entry of the particle into the target cells, um, but also uh, they also interfere with the internalization and the processing of the particle in its route to in fact uh, transduce the cells. They can also participate in this antibody dependent cytotoxicity and uh, they will also trigger complement and activation of the cells. So what's important here is that in fact uh, we don't really still understand very well how these natural infections can raise those antibodies. One thing that should not be forgotten is that in fact AVs are dependovirus, so when infection occurs it also occurs with the other virus that helps AV to replicate and so there's probably in fact a much broader immunization that we still don't understand. What's clear here is that we start to look at, for instance, uh, the, um, uh, the effects that this can have when you're going to inject uh, another AV. And as was recently published by uh, Federico Mingozzi and his colleagues, for instance, if you look at seropositive uh, individuals or seronegative, and you take their B cells and re-stimulate with peptides for the AV capsid, you see that, of course, the seropositive will, in fact, redifferentiate B cells into antibody-secreting cells very, very effectively which means that in fact there will be an impact on, on, on your ability to be in fact uh, uh, treated or not by gene therapy. So what can you do here? Well, you can screen and select seronegative individuals for the trial. Immunosuppression and particularly B cell depleting agents are insufficient to take care of these pre-existing antibodies. 
There's been some attempts at removing them by plasmapheresis, which in fact can be somewhat effective, but you need to have repeated rounds of plasmapheresis. And in fact, this is affecting at lowering low titers, but high titers are really difficult to uh, be controlled in this manner. Um, um, Mingozi had proposed, for instance, also to use capsid decoys, and this has been shown in some models that you can actually dampen and sort of, you know, uh, uh, asphyxiate, so to speak, uh, these uh, uh, antibodies. But there are probably concerns to use that in humans by fear of perhaps immunizing against the uh, capsid uh, and, and getting some T cell responses. What can be done, however, is to, in fact, generate modified capsids, make new variants, uh, engineering them in the way that uh, Dirk has presented previously. And there are some really promising stealth capsids which have been uh, generated by some investigators, in particular by doing a structure, a guided approach to identify the uh, immunodominant epitopes that actually bind antibodies, and you can select for variants which don't uh, recognize antibodies present in uh, individuals. So uh, some uh, variants in fact can be found and are very promising I think uh, for the for the future so um, besides the existence of these uh, pre-existing antibodies to the capsid of course when the AV comes into the target cells it is endocytosed and it is in fact uh, interacting with toll-like receptors or other uh, other aspects but it's decapsidated and in fact the capsid is then uh, uh, processed by the uh, proteasome and it's presented uh, on the ER uh, to class 1 and it's loaded on the class 1 molecules and then presented and in fact it can interact and be recognized uh, by cytotoxic T cells which are specific for this capsid. And that problem of uh, the induction of cytotoxic T cells against the capsid has been identified already quite some time ago in the initial trials for uh, hemophilia by uh, CATI high and uh, they showed that actually this occurred in people when they there's liver delivery and you can and in fact detect the transaminitis and uh, you can find as has been shown here uh, with the uh, uh, demonstration that you have uh, with with tetramer you can in fact detect capsid specific CD8 T cells and this has been found again more recently in the uh, clinical trial that was conducted by Amitna 20 where he's showing here for instance uh, the um, uh, induction here, uh, you can see here the elevation of transaminitis here that's uh, induced here and you have at the same time the loss of your uh, transgene of the factor 9 and this in fact can be controlled to some extent by the administration of corticosteroids which uh, deal with this uh, transaminitis if it's given uh, soon enough. Uh, this effect seems to be capsid dose dependent. It's not seen when people receive low doses of, of, uh, of vector, but uh, when they have high doses, then uh, they, they are inducing uh, in some patients uh, this uh, liver toxicity with transaminase. I think that one thing that should be uh, really looked at here is that these CD8 T cells that are specific for the capsid are probably just the end in fact, but one aspect here that's very important is the induction of capsid-specific CD40 cells. Remember that actually uh, here was depicted the target cell, which is MHC class 1 positive, like any kind of tissue uh, in the body, but you have also professional antigen-presenting cells which express MHC class 2 and then can present to CD40 cells and also to CD80 cells. And these can also be targeted, of course, by AV, and they will, in fact, trigger CD4 response. Helper uh, uh, activation can, in fact, also activate CD8 cells, arm them, prime them, and induce this memory, uh, long-term memory T cell response. But also, of course, it will prime B cell response in the production of antibodies. So it's very important to understand how APCs interact with AV. And there are several types of of antigen presenting cells, conventional dendritic cells, myeloid dendritic cells, B cells are also APCs, plasmacytoid dendritic cells, they all have different phenotype and different function. And so we became interested, for instance, to figure out which of these APCs can interact with some of the AV. So we looked in the mouse, which is not, of course, necessarily the most per pertinent uh, organism to look at, but we took some AV, which is uh, Florence labeled and inject that in vivo to the mouse and you can see here that in fact AV can readily interact with myeloid cells. We see 11B positive disease as well as CD11C positive disease. If you in fact subfractionate that you can see that you interact very, very effectively with all kinds of dendritic cells and macrophages and monocytes. B cells don't seem to be very well targeted in that manner um, in the mice which are in fact naive for AV uh, to start with. 
The question is, you know, if we interact easily with uh, different types of APCs, which of these APCs actually process the capsid and present that to T cells? So we have a model by which we can graft into the capsid an epitope that's presented only to CD4 cells when we'll use uh, TCR transgenic T cells that recognize that particular DBY peptide. And what you can see here, in fact, is that only the uh, professional myeloid um, C11C positive dendritic cells are actually effectively capable of presenting the capsid, but the macrophages and monocytes were not, and the B cells neither. Also, uh, they were not also active, um, capable of presenting the uh, uh, this uh, capsid to the T cells. What we showed also is that these innate signals, in particular uh, innate signals uh, which are uh, recognized and transmitted through TLR9 and MYD88, in this case are very important to trigger and activate those capsid-specific T cells in the mice. And so they really control this CD4-TH1 dependent, in fact, uh, capsid response that's very effective in activating the T cells and also raising some of the antibodies to the capsid. So one of the problems here is, in fact, that these T cell uh, CD4 help is generating a lot of antibodies, and there's also a very specific B cell response that I don't really have time to go into. But what's important to understand is that you always get antibodies when you uh, in inject AAV, and that this... Um, and this is seen in all the models, all of the animal models, all the preclinical and also in humans. And it prevents reignitration of the same serotype with the exception of the injection of AV in the eye because it's a very specific environment. Uh, but otherwise, then it's, it's a problem. And I think that this is really a problem that we need to start to address because we are starting to use AV in gene therapy in conditions with which probably there's a potential that we might need to re-administer AV, and so, like, for instance, in children, and I think that it would be important to not be uh, inducing antibodies to the serotype that we're using. So we know already for a long time that we can use immunosuppression to completely prevent the induction of antibody or T-cell responses to the capsid. There's been some papers already a long time ago using mycophenolate or other types of very strong immunosuppressors, and you can really completely suppress that. You can also deplete CD4 cells and add cyclosporine, for instance. But I think these are potentially too toxic to be used in all of the uh, patients that we want to treat with gene therapy. So we've been looking at other methods to do that, and again, thinking about the potentially central role of CD4 cells in this immune response. We started looking, for instance, at an antioxidant, which in fact provokes a, a temporary reduction in CD4 uh, in mice. And uh, as you can see here, you have a downregulation of CD4 uh, that is induced very rapidly after the administration of this MNTBAP, uh, which is a, a, a SOD mimetic that we have administered to the mice. Uh, you downregulate rapidly CD4. It's actually a quite profound downregulation, as you can see, and it's temporary. When you stop the treatment, then it goes back up at the surface of the cells. And if you inject this uh, uh, antioxidant, for instance, before and after doing uh, the AAV injection, then you can in fact completely reduce the induction of antibodies. You can actually come back with a second injection with the same serotype and in fact you can see that you can redose effectively. This is done in fact in a very artificial model with, uh, in conditions that are probably not therapeutic, but I think that this makes the point that you can in fact have a very targeted perhaps intervention at a very specific time point and have the ability to redose. And in fact my colleagues at Geneton, uh, working with Federico Mingozzi and with the um, um, Selecta Bioscience, have used the SVP rapamycin uh, particle, which are nanoparticles uh, made of uh, PLGA and uh, that enca encapsulate rapamycin, and they have been co-injected with AV, and they have uh, just recently published a very nice paper where they actually utilize this in a really therapeutically relevant model, both in mice and in non-human primates, and they can show that they can also redose come back, they re reduce the induction of antibodies in mice or in non-human primates, and they can come back and, in fact, increase also the uh, expression of the transgene. Uh, they can really enhance with AV8 hepatocyte transduction, and they can also demonstrate in this context that they probably have an effect that is partially mediated by the induction of Tregs. So, um, 
The last point I'd like to cover is this question of anti-transgene immunity. We've discussed the capsid now. What about the transgene? So I've taken this very complex graph from Roland Herzog. I've adapted a little bit. Uh, I'm not showing, of course, you know, it's very hard to have all of the aspects of the immune response uh, that is induced after AV gene transfer in the single cell uh, slide, in single slide. But here, uh, let's discuss um, the uh, transduction of the cells and the expression of the transgene. And again, uh, what I would like to show you is that it's very important to imagine that in fact AV will trigger the professional antigen presenting cells because in fact it will uh, provoke the recognition of some innate, innate signals, in particular the viral genome, but as well the capsid. And in fact it will transduce the cells and activate both CD4 and CD8 T cell responses uh, which will also activate themselves and lead to the uh, induction of antibiotics bodies. And for a long time, these questions of anti-transgene immune responses have remained uh, really uh, sort of theoretical questions which were very easy to study in preclinical models, but were not seen very much into clinical trials. Uh, but uh, we're starting to see that, and I'm taking the example, for instance, of this uh, clinical trial uh, which was published recently by uh, Tardieu and Zera in Lancet Neurology uh, two years ago uh, for the treatment of MPS-3B. And uh, they have found, in fact, uh, uh, even though they were immunosuppressing the patients, that they had, in fact, uh, um, anti-naglu T cells, which were not detected at the induction but were induced after gene therapy. And, of course, this is a brain disease, and it's a little bit complicated, and, you know, it's very difficult to know how to deal and how, you know, to, to, to manage these kinds of anti transgen immune responses. So again, um, which cells, which antigen presenting cells could be presenting the transgene? And uh, we've done the same kind of experiments as, as I've described before. And um, in fact, in this case, we see that different kinds of APCs can present both the uh, dendritic cells but also monocyte macrophages and uh, not B cells in this context, but um, I think this is important because that means that there is in fact broad uh, mechanisms that are potentially involved in the induction of anti transgene immune responses. So one thing we know how to do because the transgene is expressed, you can regulate transgene expression. You can try to really narrowly control transgene expression only in the tissue of choice but not in the immune system. And there's many different ways to do that using specific promoters. One of these ways is in fact to use this microRNA 1423P target to in fact detarget the transgene from uh, cells of hematopoietic origin. So this is what I'm showing here and in fact both in the CD11C positive cells whoops, or in the uh, C11B uh, monocyte macrophage you can in fact easily detarget your transgene expression and this has a really dramatic effect in fact in maintaining a very nice uh, structure for instance when you inject very immunogenic transgene into the muscle you avoid the destruction that you can have when you don't have in fact when you don't have uh, this regulation you really have a destruction and infiltration of the muscle but you really prevent that uh, by using this control. Now, sorry, this is uh, very easy to do in a normal muscle, normal mouse, but when you have in fact a model that is pathologic, such as the sarcoglycan deficient mice, which have a very high fragility in muscle, a very strong infiltration in myeloid cells, well, it's impossible in fact to maintain this regulated uh, um, uh, immune, uh, uh, immune uh, control. And in fact, you lose rapidly your transgene. And uh, one thing that we have shown is that there's initially a very good maintenance of the regulation of antigenic uh, um, presentation. But at day eight, after a while, in fact, we're losing that. And we are, in fact, showing that in B6 mice, in normal mice, you can maintain this nice regulation. But in the sarcoglycan deficient mice, there's an escape. And what's escaping, in fact, is also completely dependent on CD4 cells. If we cross these mice with CD4 knockout mice, we have a complete restoration of the transgene expression and no immune response, whereas the CD8 knockout mice or beta-2 microglobulin, uh, uh, in fact, do not prevent this destruction. So CD8 cells are, of course, effector cytolytic T cells, but they are not the only cells that can actually participate to tissue destruction. And CD4 T cells, in fact, are very important to arm all kinds of other cells, including macrophages, to also perform tissue destruction. So this is complex, but what's happening in a tissue that is in fact inflamed and is degraded at the same time as you're doing gene transfer is that in fact you are putting your transgene 
uh, and it's going into uh, the tissue, but also in antigen presenting cells. But as you're, and so these APCs will come and prime the T cell response into the lymph nodes. But at the same time, your tissue will degrade and will, in fact, release proteins which are also picked up by the APC and brought to the lymph node and reactivate the CD4 T cell response. So uh, you generate expansion and you generate, in fact, this uh, very complex immune response that's very difficult to control. And in fact, there is uh, in muscle a lot of different tissues and so we should, a lot of different um, uh, damage associated molecular patterns which have been identified and are secondary to inflammation. So I think all of these, uh, these uh, uh, microbial system, uh, signals, uh, you know, such as TLRs, but also tissue associated molecular signals should be all considered as a really aggravating factor that can uh, accelerate and also um, enhance, in fact, the immune response. So how can we uh, control and predict these immune responses? This is really a, actually a very complicate, complicated question because, of course, in preclinical models and in mice, it's easy to kill the mice, sample things, and look at that. In humans, of course, you know, the only tissue that we have reasonable access is basically the blood, which is not necessarily the most relevant tissue to, in fact, look at the immune response. I've shown you that, in fact, a lot of the CD4 response is happening in lymph nodes and not necessarily in the periphery. So it's very complicated, but um, Federico Mingozzi has established a Geneton Clinical Immunology Laboratory that is uh, run by uh, Philippe Veron, and they are looking at different aspects of these immune responses in humans, looking at, of course, the, uh, uh, the presence of antibodies to the capsid, and also looking at banks of peptides and to look at the T cell responses. Um, they are also trying to put in place you know, high throughput methods to really look at uh, uh, these immune responses in a broad manner to be uh, not uh, you know, uh, selective and, and, and not biased into their uh, ways to look at that. They've just recently published a paper, in fact, that showed that, for instance, uh, interferon gamma, which is very often looked at uh, for uh, the ability to read out a T cell response, is not necessarily the best cytokine to look at an AV anticapsid response, for instance, that TNF alpha is probably a better uh, way to, in fact, detect uh, um, capsid specific T cells. Uh, they've also found that, in fact, surprisingly, NK cells can be uh, reactive in seronegative individuals, but not uh, as much in seropositive uh, individuals. So there are some things that we still understand that are very important to continue to study. And, uh, of course, to track and follow the patients who are uh, treated by gene therapy and with immunosuppressor. So the question is whether or not there is an ideal vector for an ideal uh, AV for gene therapy. Um, if we had to define that, this would be an AV that can escape neutralizing antibodies, pre-existing antibodies, so they certainly would have to have a modified capsid. It would induce minimal uh, anti-capsid immune responses, and I think, as Dirk said, there's many different aspects that can contribute to that. Uh, it should not activate the innate response. It should have also a genome that is not seen very much by the innate system. There should be a very high therapeutic index so that you inject very low dose. Uh, we have not addressed at all the issue of production and contaminants, which are known to, in fact, participate to immunization, so that also should be very low, and it should not be aggregated because aggregation of uh, particulate uh, uh, drugs is known also to be immunogenic. And, of course, it should be not presented by professional APCs in theory. Uh, we should have a way to control transient expression and to avoid the uh, introduction of the capsid in the APC. So uh, this makes actually a, a really stringent uh, list of things, and I don't know if this is possible to find such an AV. So perhaps there are other vector systems that, in fact, might have to be considered now, but uh, uh, I'm a little bit biased. I like lantivar vectors also. So anyway, um, in conclusion, um, I think that uh, even though we've been discussing a lot about problems and things, one thing to keep in mind, however, is that AV gene therapy is well tolerated in people, uh, generally speaking. It does induce very complex immune responses, and they can potentially affect safety and, and efficacy, and they also remain problematic in some aspects, so we need to continue to work on that. I think that we are seeing very promising advances in the way to control these immune responses with very smart or very targeted immunosuppression, and I'm sure that this is a field that will continue to improve, and that will find the right and the adequate immunosuppressive treatment to in fact treat the patients. We also have very promising new capsids and new vectors, so I think that you know, in the end the field will evolve in a very uh, good way. I think that 
the patient inflammatory status is something perhaps that is underestimated and uh, really should be looked at very carefully. And uh, there's a lot of genetic diseases that have degeneration and, and that creates a lot of inflammation. And I think that at this point we're still, even though there's a lot of commercial interest in gene therapy, I think we should always be very careful uh, to know what we're doing and, and in particular for these immune responses, a thorough immunomonitoring in the follow-up of the patient to me is still extremely important to know exactly and to understand the effects of gene therapy. And so uh, the last point is that uh, to go back to what Dirk was saying uh, in his uh, ideal new vector, perhaps these new capsid variants and these new superactive vectors should also include systematically uh, a study of you know, how they interact and how they work with the immune system. So I'll leave it with that. I just want to thank all my colleagues at Geneton that have contributed some data and the people that I've uh, uh, had some slides from. Um, and I want to thank you for your attention and I take the opportunity to show that we have some positions to fill. Thank you. Thank you.